Good afternoon, um, everybody. My name is Kasia Cordas, and I co-direct the community um, uh, for global health equity at uh, the University at Buffalo. I want to welcome you to the webinar today uh, and to our co-production of knowledge for global health equity series more broadly. In this monthly series, we examine a model of knowledge building that might be unfamiliar to some of you. Co-produced knowledge means different things to different people. Uh, but by co-produced, we, the organizers, mean knowledge that is developed under the auspices of a cooperative and mutually respectful relationship between people whose practice springs from academia and those whose expertise arises from practice and or lived experience within a given community. Um, today, we're excited to welcome Dr. Allison Parker, but before I give the floor over to her, I'd like to point you to the chat box. Throughout the talk, you should feel free to use the chat box to type in your comments or questions, um, and you can uh, respond or uh, sort of talk amongst yourselves um, as well. And then after uh, Dr. Parker finishes uh, speaking, we will bring your questions to her attention. Um, and you will also have the opportunity to use the Q&A box uh, to, to ask questions um, at the conclusion of the, of the talk. So um, I will now introduce Dr. Parker, uh, who is our speaker today. Uh, uh, thank you for joining us. It's our pleasure to have you here. Uh, Dr. Parker received her doctorate in ec uh, ecology and evolutionary biology from the University of Toronto. Um, and she has been um, with the Woodrow Wilson uh, International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. since 2008. And since uh, 2020 is the um, senior program associate in the science and technology innovation program. She is also on the board of directors and currently chairs uh, the Citizen Science Association and is member of the editorial board for the peer reviewed journal um, called Citizen Science Theory and Practice. At the Woodrow, uh, at the Wilson Center, uh, Dr. Parker evaluates and amplifies innovative and participatory approaches to science and technology, including citizen science and low cost and open hardware. Um, Previously, um, as part of the innovation team in the Office um, of Research and Development um, at the US Environmental Protection Agency, uh, Dr. Parker led initiatives to increase the use of crowdsourcing and citizen science for EPA research and decision making. And uh, again, it's our pleasure to welcome you here and we look forward to hearing from you. So go ahead. Excellent. Um, thank you so much, Kaja, for that introduction, and thank you to all the organizers for the invitation to talk to you all today. I'm really happy to be here um, to talk to you all about citizen science and community science for decision making and policy. Um, and I really hope to tie this into the excellent seminar series that you all have been having over the last several months um, on co-production of knowledge. I've been following along and um, there's been some really fascinating discussions and topics. Um, I think, yeah, so as mentioned, I'm Allison Parker. I'm a, a senior program associate at the Wilson Center. Um, and the Wilson Center is a sort of quasi federal, so somewhat federal <laughs> um, think tank in Washington, DC. Um, and there I'm on the science or in the science and technology innovation program where I'm really looking at emerging issues in science and technology, especially those with a sort of uh, participatory lens. So I've done a lot of work within citizen science um, and more recently I've been focused on hardware and other sort of tools for science. Um, and all of it has an, a lens towards bringing in a broader public um, sort of broadening science to include science and society. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to be here. So today I'm planning to start with a little bit of an introduction to my experience that uh, Kaja mentioned. Um, and I'll spend a little bit of extra time on that because I think it's actually an interesting link to 
the trajectory of citizen science more broadly. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, and I plan to sort of situate myself in this broader discussion about co-produced knowledge um, and tie in how I think about citizen science and community science. Um, yeah, in that broader conceptual discussion, uh, which I think is really fascinating. Um, and then in the second half of the talk, I think I will delve more specifically into citizen science for policy and decision making, um, which is a topic that I've been interested in for the last number of years and um, is near and dear to my heart. And um, yeah, so within that, I'll, I'll sort of highlight a range of ways that citizen science has influenced policy and sort of outline what I see as the potential for broader impact um, for citizen science and other participatory approaches. And I think including um, how you all have been discussing co-production of knowledge within that. Um, and I also hope to leave a lot of time for questions at the end. Um, so hopefully I will get through a lot of this material at the end. So please feel free to make a note of your questions and um, send them into the chat box and I'm sure we'll have time to get to them. Okay, and then we'll get started. So um, in the introduction, they mentioned my uh, degree in ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Toronto, not far from you all in Buffalo, for those of you in Buffalo. Um, and I wanted to mention it here because um, my introduction to citizen science um, was maybe similar to others in that it was within a sort of natural resource setting, which, which it seems has a, um, there are quite a few sort of citizen science uh, projects within natural resources and um, areas like ecology. And so in my PhD, I was looking at pollination systems and um, there was one specific project that I was working on where I was trying to understand how pollinator uh, diversity varied over a geographic landscape. So this was a wildflower that I was interested in and I wanted to see like when it was visited by bees and when it was visited by flies. Um, and there was one point where I realized that basically I couldn't be everywhere that I wanted to be um, at the time I needed to be there. And so the solution that we came up, to, came up with was for me to use citizen science and basically ask volunteers to go out and do some uh, pollination observations for me so I could get a, an understanding of how the pollinator community varied across uh, the Eastern United States. So a, a pretty small project um, in citizen science, but it was an introduction for me into this new approach to thinking about science um, and a, a conceptual way of um, yeah, thinking about my particular research questions in the context of a broader society, um, as well as links to things like environmental education and uh, communication. So from there, I went to Washington, D.C., where I was a fellow on the innovation team um, at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And in that role, I really did focus in on citizen science. And there, it was really focusing on two different aspects of citizen science, which again, I think is highly relevant to this uh, talk today. Um, much of what I worked on related to the use of citizen science for EPA research. So if we think about people in EPA labs around the country that were interested in a certain topic and they really wanted to uh, engage people and um, bring people into the work that they were doing on a topic that they were researching anyway. So very sort of driven by um, EPA priorities and by the scientists priorities as well. Um, and so I focused on sort of supporting those projects and, and figuring out how to do citizen science within uh, the EPA world, navigating some institutional barriers, etc. Um, but at the same time, I was also thinking about citizen science from a bit of a um, broader perspective in terms of really how it relates to environmental protection more broadly. Um, and specifically how EPA might think about citizen science 
yeah, in the context of its, its broader mission to um, protect the environment. Uh, and, and really what the opportunity might be in terms of having a more uh, holistic and um, engaging strategy towards environmental protection that really brought in members of the public um, to work with them on it. Um, <clears throat> and so I'll talk more about this towards the end of the talk, but um, basically at, during this time at EPA, I learned a ton about citizen science and how it was sort of happening around the country and around the world. Um, and specifically, I learned also about a, a sort of whole, whole set of projects that a lot of people talk about as citizen science, but others talk more about um, as sort of community science. So projects that are driven by communities that are interested in some aspect of their environment, um, perhaps with an environmental concern or issue that they wanted to solve um, and using citizen science or community science as a, a tool or method to be able to solve that problem. So I'll talk more about that, but of course that links, I think to a lot of the work that you all have been discussing in the seminar series and um, to things like global health equity and um, environmental justice and community community based participatory research and really a whole range of approaches there. Um, and as mentioned, I'm now at the Wilson Center where which is actually right next door to the these buildings are right next door to each other um, here in DC but um, again at the Wilson Center focusing on citizen science and, and other tools for science with a participatory lens um, and but importantly, what I do is really sort of at the landscape scale. So thinking about um, broad trends in science and technology and it really take like a 30,000 foot view of these kinds of approaches um, and not so much practical work on the ground with communities, which I know is, has been the focus of a lot of the uh, uh, seminars that you've been um, hosting so far this year, so. A sort of complementary perspective to that really important work that's happening. Um, so, which leads me to sort of, I'm going to spend the first maybe third of this talk thinking about uh, these, these broad approaches in terms of like citizen science, community science, um, linking that maybe to co-production of knowledge um, and and thinking about the intersection of all of those. And then following that, I'll get more into um, citizen science with a, a policy perspective and sort of outline where I think we are, at least in the, uh, the environmental world or environmental protection, um, what, I, what I see as opportunity and um, success so far in terms of citizen science and impact on policy and decision-making. Um, and then, yeah, we'll end with questions. So, so just to start, um, this is a definition for citizen science that is used fairly broadly within federal communities. So thinking about citizen science as when the public participates voluntarily in the scientific process, addressing real world problems in ways that may include a variety of things, including research questions, conducting experiments, collecting and analyzing data, interpreting results, making discoveries, developing technologies, solving problems. So really so many ways that citizen science can play out. I think the vast majority of times we are talking about projects that include this um, third aspect of it, which is collecting and analyzing data, mainly collecting data. So um, that's what we see most often with uh, citizen science projects. Um, and you all may have heard of some of these more popular citizen science projects that have really kind of exploded over recent years and are, I think, really great examples of um, how citizen science can have a broad impact. This is iNaturalist, which is really a platform for um, citizen science work, uh, and it allows for people to go out and do species identifications, um, take pictures of what they see, and then also on the flip side, 
participate in actually identifying different species. Um, you may have also heard of eBird, which is a sort of quintessential example of citizen science and was a big part in getting the whole citizen science movement going. Um, and that's, again, an infrastructure, <clears throat> excuse me, for people to go out and do observations of birds that they see. This is immensely popular for birders um, to be able to both track their bird sightings as well as um, participate in this broader community of, of people doing observations of birds. And both of these projects have absolutely incredible um, data collections now or um, infrastructure for um, being able to, to bring all this data together and visualize it and start to understand really what's going on for biodiversity um, around the world and specifically for bird migration and biodiversity as well with eBird. Um, and importantly, the, both of these projects um, link their data up to, to larger uh, global databases of biodiversity. iNaturalist contributes to GBIF, which is the Global Biodiversity Index something <laughs> for biodiversity data. And so um, they both have a massive impact on, on data collection more broadly. Um, I'd say the, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of other projects um, that are much smaller and much more um, sort of contained, but these are some quintessential examples, as I mentioned. And, and both are examples of this um, sort of more foundational type of citizen science, which I see as mainly sort of institutionally driven often or scientist driven. So a lot of times these begin with a scientist or a group of um, scientists or a lab or, you know, sort of like me when I was in my PhD work, um, I had a question that I needed answered. And so I engaged people towards answering that question. Um, whereas there's a lot of new work, well, it's, it's been happening forever, but the um, another sort of thread with citizen science is thinking about uh, community science, which is, again, sometimes called citizen science and sometimes not, but it really is a distinct type of work in which collaboratively led scientific investigations and exploration um, address really community defined questions. Um, and these projects allow for engagement in the whole scientific process. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, are really defined by the communities. They're initiated um, and driven by people on the ground um, who often have a concern or have an issue that they need um, further uh, information and data on in order to move towards resolving that issue. And so this is an important distinction, I think, for um, the, the conversation at large and also for my work at EPA, it was um, really interesting to start to learn about um, the different ways that um, citizen science and community science play out in relation to this question of co-produced knowledge, which we're all here to talk about. Um, let me just get some water. Um, and so just for a few quick examples of this more community-driven citizen science, one is right near you all, um, for those of you in Buffalo, um, in Tonawanda, New York, uh, the Clean Air Coalition of New York was a, a really small group of community members that were concerned about um, local air quality and health impacts that were happening um, and that they were noticing in their um, communities. And so they went out and collected data using these uh, buckets. It's called a, sometimes called a bucket brigade. I'm going to go and collect these air samples and they found extremely high levels of benzene um, and other, other pollutants uh, in the area. And um, it's really an amazing story. It, it took a really long time, but eventually they were able to get the attention of the local state environmental agency, sorry, not the local, but the state environmental agency. Um, and eventually that um, was escalated to, I think the, the EPA as a whole and resulted in uh, actually a criminal case um, against the environmental manager of um, Tonawanda Coke, a local industry. And so this is an example of where, you know, the whole project was really driven by 
community members and they did engage with um, local researchers as well. Um, and we can we can get into all of that, but importantly, it, you know, this this project and others like it driven by communities and driven by community concerns. I think another uh, set of examples that relates to this more community driven citizen science is volunteer water monitoring, which is a really, um, really massive uh, set of initiatives across the country in the US and around the world too. But um, I think at one point somebody attempted to count and, and found more than 1700 groups across the United States, I'm sure it's more by now, um, that were monitoring the condition of local water bodies, including streams, lakes, estuaries, et cetera, um, and documenting various parameters and data about other local water monitoring. And so I think this is a really interesting set of initiatives for a variety of reasons um, that I'll probably get into later when we talk more about uh, policy making um, and, and how some of these data can influence uh, decision making both at the local and state um, and at the national level. Um, this is just another picture of people involved in, in water quality monitoring. And I'll quickly mention that, of course, there, in addition to these two big, big buckets of work that I mentioned in citizen science and sort of more community science, um, there's a whole host of other approaches that I think share similar, um, similar values and similar goals um, and really have broadened the way that we think about science. Um, and I think, um, there was one sort of foundational study a number of years ago that attempted to outline the ways in which um, public participants interacted with scientists through public participation in scientific research. So I think um, PPSR is, is sort of another, another name for citizen science um, that is used and, and was used um, around the time that this paper was published. And so the authors here outlined um, five different ways that uh, essentially citizen science projects worked with members of the public. Um, again, relating back to the co-production of knowledge that we're focused on today. So one being a contract where um, a community member or a, a member of the public might ask a scientist to conduct a scientific investigation. And then the second one contribute, I think is the, the one we see the most often in citizen science more broadly, which is the contributory style, where um, a member of the public is asked by a scientist to collect and contribute data, um, and sometimes samples, but most often data. Collaborative work is, as it sounds, more collaborative between um, scientists and the public. Um, and then co-create, I think, really links to the co-production of knowledge. Um, which is where scientists and um, non-scientists or non-professional scientists work together to develop a study and work with input from both scientists and community members. <clears throat> and then finally, this last topic, our last category, um, collegial citizen science in which, um, and this is more like the, the sort of community-driven citizen science that I was presenting earlier in which um, members of the public independently conduct research that may or may not involve a scientist at all. And then I pulled out um, the, the definition of co-produced knowledge that was presented at the beginning of this seminar because I thought it was interesting to look at um, in the context of um, how I think about citizen science and community science. Um, so just to reiterate uh, the the definition presented by our organizers, which I appreciate, I think it's a good one, of knowledge that is developed under the auspices of a cooperative, mutually respectful relationship between people whose practice springs from academia and those whose expertise arise from practice and or lived experience within a given community. Um, this, I think if, it, if we broaden the academia part to, to include other types of institutions, like policy, or sorry, like uh, governmental 
uh, institutions um, and potentially some nonprofit kinds of work. I think this uh, definition of co-produced knowledge really can link up to both the citizen science and community science approaches, depending of course on this essential mutually respectful part, which um, I think is often a central feature of citizen science and community science, but certainly not always. Um, and that's an area I think for future work and it's an ongoing conversation um, within the citizen science community um, and working towards sort of uh, ways we can uh, develop standards and best practices and et cetera, et cetera, towards um, more, more respectful relationships and more <clears throat> ways to build in appropriate working relationships between um, more institutionally driven um, scientists and others, and then those from communities or from the broader public. And just a note that, um, as I keep mentioning, all of these different types of work that relate to sort of science and the broader public, science and society, um, really stand at this location at the point where public participation and knowledge production or the societal context and the epistemology meet. And that that intersection can take many different forms as, as we've outlined, um, <clears throat> but that they're all sort of part of the same broader landscape. And this, this quote is from Alan Irwin, who was one of the one of the two people to first use the phrase citizen science um, and they, they used it in somewhat different ways, but it's interesting to look back at now. Um, I'll pause there for a second because I think in this next section, I wanted to move towards um, the linkages between uh, citizen science and policy and sort of decision making. <clears throat> so here's just a quick quote that and I think it's been a broader conversation um, within the citizen science community um, and, and more broadly about how we can think about citizen science as more than just data collection and think about visualization analysis and action. And I wanted to talk quickly about a recent paper from uh, Claudia Goebel and others um, in the journal Citizen Science Theory and Practice, which I, I was an editor for a special collection that looked at citizen science and policy. And this was one of uh, the papers in that. Um, and I thought it was a really great way of thinking about citizen science projects as a part of a sort of ecosystem of science policy, um, including funding processes. And then also importantly, just what's happening outside of science policy um, and funding and direct transformation of the world and decision-making. So I thought this was a helpful framework to, for which we can think about citizen science and policymaking um, and the different sort of what they call governance modes for how to um, <clears throat> think about yeah, citizen science in the context of, of governance, more, governance more broadly than just um, policymaking. Um, the first one being information for policymaking. So thinking about citizen science as a source of information that can feed into science and then into also policy improvement. So it's a bit more of a linear way of thinking about um, citizen science for policy and decision making. And much of what I, I'll talk about today fits into this category. Um, and I think it's also the most um, <clears throat> the one that we tend to think about the most. The second is as an object of research policy. So thinking about citizen science as an approach to doing research and communication that is actually itself um, sort of an object of policy making. So a lot of this, I tend to think about, um, you know, when the federal government or when other um, entities sort of create structures and create regulations for, for how citizen science should be conducted or could be conducted. 
Um, and so I'll mention some of that uh, in this second half of this talk as well. And then there's two other <clears throat> sort of governance modes that I won't really get into today, but I think are essential for really understanding, um, again, citizen science as a, as a policy or as a governance structure more broadly. Um, one is as a policy instrument. So thinking about citizen science as being used as an instrument itself to advance an agenda um, with science and society. Um, and a lot of times you can see things like this in funding calls where they're, they're looking for a specific type of work um, and then use citizen science or other approaches like it to sort of put that into practice. Um, and then finally, this fourth category of social socio-technical governance. So thinking about basically just how citizen science um, plays out in the broader world. So, and how that affects governance processes sort of down the line um, through non-policy actors, like just through direct work with the public. So I just encourage you all to take a look at this um, if you want to uh, think more about um, the different ways that um, this can play out uh, with governance beyond these first two um, that are, I think, more obvious. <clears throat> so I thought I'd send, spend the next 10 minutes or so talking about this big question of sort of when does citizen science influence government actions and decisions. And I worked on a paper a couple years ago with a number of colleagues from the George Washington University Law School, as well as um, a, a couple of us had a previous work with the Environmental Protection Agency. So we had that as a sort of basis for this look at citizen science um, as sort of what the current impact of citizen science is um, in environmental policy or environmental work um, in the United States. And I'll just review quickly um, what we did and what we found in order to contribute to this broader discussion of um, really what the current role of citizen science is in terms of government actions and decisions and really what the potential is, which I think is a very different uh, discussion. And there's a lot of potential that is unrealized right now. <clears throat> so to do this, to get into this topic, we took a look at 10 case studies um, in order to try to get a sense of the reality of life in the field. Um, uh, we did a bunch of interviews with uh, citizen science projects and citizen scientists themselves, as well as federal and state officials and researchers, NGOs, et cetera. Um, we focused mainly on projects that dealt with air and water pollution and exposure to toxic metals um, is just one project in particular, but um, most of them dealt with air and water pollution and were not natural resource projects because that, that conversation is a bit more developed, the, the role of natural resource projects. Um, so looking at environmental, um, environmental projects themselves was a, a different set of projects with a different set of conclusions, I think. So again, about half of the projects were focused on air quality, about half were focused on volunteer water monitoring or, or water quality of some, in some way. And then there was one project, Garden Roots, that is a really great project that looks at um, sort of toxics in vegetables, in, in um, vegetable gardens uh, near Superfund sites. Oh, and here's a list of all the case studies. If you want to, I won't go into any of these um, very in, in much detail, but um, just to get a sense of all the different ways that um, these projects play out, we have projects that look at local air quality in one particular neighborhood, um, others that look at uh, things like particulate matter over a, an entire urban area, um, another that is a monitoring network across a state and then also thinking about the impacts of a particular facility uh, 
in terms of pollution, in this case in LA. <clears throat> and then similarly with, with water, um, looking at one that dealt with the Chesapeake Bay as a whole, or really actually this was looking at a number of different projects, thinking about the uh, water quality of the Chesapeake Bay, a multi-state campaign, um, one in particular that was gathering data to support a piece of litigation, a statewide water assessment, um, and another one that, that actually did lead to retaliation. So a, a variety of projects um, that have some similarities, but also had different goals and approaches. And so just a quick look at some of the conclusions that we drew from this look at case studies within citizen science um, for environmental protection. The biggest uh, takeaway, I think, from this work and from really any work looking at citizen science is just that there's such a diversity of approaches. There's a huge number of projects out there um, and they're all different and they, in this case, impact many forms of government action. Um, another really broad conclusion that we came to that again, most uh, most like broader looks at citizen science, I think would also come to a similar conclusion is that these projects are very sophisticated um, and have a really strong focus on data quality and really build in a lot of different ways to um, sort of emphasize the data quality aspect to them um, in order to be taken seriously. Um, <clears throat> another sort of broad generalization we came to was just the, um, how obvious it was that there are really different uh, types of projects and different um, results and outcomes from projects that are focused in the, in the more, in water, in water quality, and then others in air and air quality. And this is related to a variety of different factors, which I think we didn't necessarily predict at the outset, um, related to technology, the types of technology that are available, um, and how, how well developed they are. The history of working within these fields, especially the regulatory history. Um, and then, yeah, the geographic focus, like how, how well these projects are, or the um, extent of, of how these projects take on different um, geographic scales, whether they're hyper-local, you know, looking at a neighborhood or just a few blocks even, uh, or focusing on one particular industrial issue versus more regional or national, looking at um, air or water quality across uh, a huge geographic region. All of those are factors. And then finally, we found a real opportunity here to for this focus on a local neighborhood scale that that, that has been a bit of a neglected area, especially within sort of environmental protection um, and environmental policy, that most environmental policy focus on, focuses on large geographic areas. And we really often don't know what's going on at the neighborhood scale. And there can be huge variability in how air and water quality is able, how, how air and water quality are documented and acted on. Um, at the local scale. <clears throat> we also found a number of barriers that were very important for determining, you know, whether or not citizen science is able to have an influence on decision making. Um, one is a general skepticism about the quality of data and the scientific rigor that goes into these projects that some projects struggled to overcome. Um, another is sort of uncertainty about rapidly changing technology. I'd say this is particularly an issue with air quality projects that often use um, low cost air sensors, uh, which have, uh, they just keep changing and it's hard to keep up with um, how, how the different technologies can impact the data that are collected um, and sort of what to do with that information. And then there's some important legal barriers that I probably won't get into today, but that um, sort of get in the way sometimes of, of citizen science projects that are seeking to have an influence on decision making. <clears throat>
And then even more importantly, I'd say, are the, the drivers, the reason that um, citizen science projects are having an influence on decision-making are, or, and also that that potential I think seems to be increasing um, is that technology expands what is possible, especially for air quality. As I mentioned, there's, especially with low cost air quality sensors, there's more and more opportunity over time to develop or to be able to collect high quality data using low cost tools. Um, and that's getting better and better. Um, and once we get a handle on how to sort of assess that technology and how to interpret the data that come from it, I think that there's a huge opportunity there to, to use those technologies more and more at which so then we'll, broader, we'll broaden who can participate. Um, we see a, rec a broader recognition in, of the reduced government capacity um, and a recognition that we have a lot of gaps in what we know about environmental quality. I think everybody knows that. Probably everybody listening uh, here is aware of that uh, kind of everything that we're missing in terms of environmental information. And then again, there's a lack of infrastructure for thinking about local problems and um, how to solve them. And most importantly, I think there's just a huge enthusiasm for citizen science. People are really interested in, in participating. More and more people are participating all the time. Um, and people also within government and within, I think, academia are more and more excited about um, citizen science as an opportunity for engaging with the public um, on their work uh, and sort of yeah, a whole range of, of benefits for everybody that participates. So we can get more into that too, but I think that's a real driver for thinking about um, increasing the way or broadening the way that we think about citizen science and its impact on decision-making. Um, I think I'll just talk for like five more minutes or so, and then hopefully we can jump to questions. Um, and I think I'll spend the last five minutes on some things that I observed, especially when I was at the Environmental Protection Agency in terms of thinking about how, how federal agencies and how government more broadly approaches citizen science. And again, when I say citizen science, I often mean more than just citizen science, but um, really participatory approaches in general, um, including co-produced knowledge. Um, but I'll start with a report that I uh, worked on with a group of 28 people that were a, it's the National Association, or I'm sorry, the National Advisory Council for Environmental Policy and Technology, which is a group of representatives from a variety of different sectors and from all across the country that um, came together to provide advice and recommendations to the Environmental Protection Agency, um, in this case, focusing on the opportunity of citizen science. Um, and this is just a quote from their report in 2016, I wait, 2018, I think, um, in which they really, they looked at citizen science as an invaluable opportunity for EPA to strengthen public support for EPA's mission and is really the best approach for the agency to connect with the public. And again, I think this applies to co-produced knowledge as well, that it's just a real opportunity for um, people in these institutions to um, strengthen their connections with society and with the, the public. And one of the big um, outcomes of that report was this spectrum of citizen science data use um, and I think this is something to look into further if you're interested. Um, but it really documents the all the different ways that citizen science can be important for environmental protection, all the way from community engagement and thinking about how citizen science plays a role in engaging communities, like sort of as an end in itself, um, and sort of promoting that. Um, that interaction um, and, and the benefits of it um, through education, through research management, regulatory decisions, all the way through to enforcement. So how citizen science can have a role um, 
in things like launching and investigations, inspections, um, civil or criminal violations. And so there aren't many examples of this, maybe a handful, um, but I think it's an area that's growing that there will be more and more examples of citizen science projects influencing policy making and decisions all across this spectrum. Um, and there's example within this report, um, there's uh, specific case studies um, linking to each of these, these ways that um, citizen science can influence environmental protection through um, policy processes. Um, and if you're interested to take a look further, there's a whole series of recommendations that this advisory council provided to EPA, including that they embrace citizen science as a core tenant of environmental protection, that they really invest in citizen science for communities, partners, and the agency. They enable the use of citizen science data. This is a big one, putting those structures in place so that citizen science can be more broadly used. Um, allowing it to, to integrate more fully into the full range of work of EPA, again, getting back to that spectrum of all the ways that citizen science can play a role. Um, so, so yeah, that's just like, a, a, I think a really good example of how, um, of the conversations that are happening within sort of federal spaces um, about the potential for citizen science and other participatory approaches um, to influence decision-making and policy. And some other examples of that kind of action are um, a few sort of important milestones within the federal world, um, all during the Obama administration. And it'll be interesting to see um, whether or not the Biden administration sort of takes this up as something that they're interested in as well. But um, in 2015, there was a memo from the um, director of OSDP, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, to federal agencies, basically asking them to engage in the citizen science conversation to try to figure out how citizen science can, can support agency needs. <clears throat> and then in 2017, um, Congress passed the um, Crowdsourcing and Citizen Science Act within a, a broader um, set of, um, I think it was America Competes um, Act. Um, so, so basically a, a, a subset of another, a larger um, act looking at innovation and competitiveness. They outlined the, the use of crowdsourcing and citizen science within the federal government um, and encouraged um, actions to, to using citizen science and crowdsourcing towards um, the missions of federal agencies and to advance and accelerate scientific research, literacy and diplomacy, et cetera. Um, so, so two major actions that I think really spurred conversation and enthusiasm for citizen science and crowdsourcing uh, within the federal government um, and I think are sort of an indication of what might be to come. So I think I've certainly talked for long enough. Um, I would be happy to take questions or to sort of respond to any thoughts that you all have about any of this variety of information that I threw at you. Um, <laughs> And also would be very happy to hear from any of you outside the scope of this presentation. If you want to email me um, or otherwise get in touch, I'd be happy to, to talk further. Thanks so much. Thank you, Allison, um, for your great presentation and um, for ending. Uh, on, on sort of <laughs> uh, the note of how the government is viewing uh, the citizen science and, and, and the enthusiasm, I think that's really encouraging. And so I want to open this up for, um, for questions. And please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box or into um, 
into chat uh, so we can get started. Um, I, I know that we have uh, people joining us from, from different institutions um, as well as countries. Uh, so uh, if you can uh, tell us where, where you're from, um, that, would, that would be wonderful. I think that would um, just, you know, broaden uh, the discussion in many different ways. The first question that I have in chat is from Alejandra. And I know, happen to know that Alejandra is from Mexico. Uh, and the question that she is asking is, uh, is there, are there any apps uh, for collecting information from, from citizens? Um, Alejandra, I wonder if you have any specific, uh, if you are asking about any specific apps that you can, um, that you can also clarify in the chat. But, um, but maybe, uh, Alison, you can begin by um, asking the, um, or answering the, the broad question or question broadly. Sure. Um, yeah, so, oh, okay, so for, for water monitoring and things like that, yes, the short answer is yes, definitely. There's probably at least tens of thousands. <laughs> um, maybe that's a stretch. But there are many, many apps available um, for collecting uh, citizen science information from people that are interested. Um, I'd say the best way to learn more would be to focus on a specific project. So trying to narrow down, and this can be hard because there's so much out there, um, trying to find a project that best suits sort of what you're interested in or what you'd like to learn more about. Um, one resource that I'll point you to is SciStarter.com. That's a, um, a website that's a sort of inventory of citizen science projects, and there's thousands on there. Um, and it allows you to search by topic and by sort of like what type of project you're interested in. If you actually want to go out and participate in a citizen science project, that's a great place to start. Um, and it would let you look specifically for an app that's available in water monitoring, for example. Um, a lot of water monitoring is a, a good example because there's probably a huge variety of apps available, but there's not like one central app that everybody uses. And so it can be a challenge to sort of navigate everything that's out there um, and, and what's best to, to participate in or or even what's best, you know, if you're interested in the data, what, how to how to access a, a sort of broader cross section of data because it can be pretty distributed. Right. Thank you. There is um, another question. Uh, this one is from Dr. David Resnick, uh, who was one of our panelists or of our um, presenters uh, earlier. Uh, and the question is, do you think there's any danger in getting the government involved in citizen science? Could too much government involvement harm the movement by putting constraints on it, pushing it in a, or pushing it in a specific direction? Um, can you can you address that? Yeah, um, I think that's a yeah, an open question and, and depends on maybe what you think about government involvement in a variety of things. Um, but certainly, yeah, there there's opportunity for, um, and I think this is true actually for more than just government involvement. I think as, as citizen science sort of progresses as a field, um, we're getting to a point where the sort of innovation and creativity has bubbled up for quite a while and now it needs to somewhat resolve or streamline a bit into whatever the next phase is. Um, and I think there is a trade-off sort of in sort of the abundance and creativity of those initial stages and then sort of um, maybe narrowing in on, on more defined projects um, that would be fewer, but maybe more, more sophisticated or more well-developed. I, I'm not finding quite the right, right words for describing this, but I think you understand what I mean. Um, so, and certainly that would that and additional government involvement might put constraints on the type of creativity that has really defined 
the field so far. Um, and, and definitely um, in terms of pushing it in a specific direction, that's a huge, you know, you could argue whether that's a good or bad thing, but um, that's something that paper I mentioned by Claudia Goebel talks about that, about using citizen science sort of as a means to an end. So if you have a specific policy priority that you're trying to accomplish um, or a specific goal that some government um, institution wants to enact, you could use citizen science as a way to sort of bring people along with you towards that goal. Um, so yes, definitely, definitely ways in which government involvement could sort of steer steer the direction of citizen science, but it's I think it's an open question as to whether you see that as a good or bad thing. Thanks for the question, it's a good one. Um, uh, you know, please continue to feel free to ask questions either in the Q&A or in the chat. I actually wonder if, as we're waiting for others to, to chime in, if you could talk about, so a lot of the projects that you've been mentioning are sort of environmental monitoring. So the health of the environment or health of um, fauna and flora. But I'm wondering if you could talk about um, any examples where there's actual health monitoring and, and whether uh, citizen uh, science projects like that um, do exist and how they may be contributing to uh, to policy, uh, you know, or or regulation. If you if you could address that. Yeah, great question. Um, there are a variety of projects that are collecting or otherwise looking at health related data. Um, some of them do it in a um, indirect way. So a lot of the environmental projects that I mentioned really are ultimately looking at health, but are doing it through um, looking at environmental um, factors or, um, you know, collecting, for example, collecting information about specific elements that you know are, are carcinogens, things like that. Uh, but definitely there are a lot of different projects that get at health data in more direct ways as well. Um, of course, there are <clears throat> ethical and privacy considerations that often are dealt with in those projects, but I know NIH has a really active citizen science and NIEHS also, the um, Institution for Environmental Health Sciences or Studies, I don't know what the S is. Um, yeah, have, have all really, got involved in um, citizen science as well. And then there's, I think really interesting, another whole category of what you might consider citizen science in terms of like disease communities. So people that um, are affected by a particular health issue, actually collecting data themselves. A lot of times these are like driven by the people affected most um, by um, health issues or uh, specific like rare diseases. Um, and there's, yeah, there's just communities popping up all over the place where people are sort of pulling information together amongst a lot of participants that are handling health issues um, and, and working with researchers then to um, turn that information into, into something more useful. Um, so there's just a ton out there that <laughs> yeah, that's just really a drop in the bucket, honestly, for, for health. Thank you. So there's a question from Seth. Um, I understand, I think I understand how citizen science can help with data collection, but how do local residents get involved with the entire research process, data analysis, interpretation, and communication? Great question. Um, there's a few ways of thinking about this. One is there are projects that um, work with the public or work with um, community members to, to do something that's not data collection. So uh, one example off the top of my head is there's a project and I can't remember the name right now, but where they ask people to actually look into um, 
research publications and look for specific things um, within research publications and sort of bring that information it, or put that information into a database to get a better sense of like what's out there in terms of the scientific literature. Um, so that's an example of people participating in the scientific process that's not necessarily data collection, it's more interpretation. Um, there's a lot having to do with data analysis. So one, if you want to check out Zooniverse.org, I think there's a lot of different projects that are gathered there that look at image analysis. So they ask people to, um, so in a lot of cases, the human eye is still way better than um, computers at detecting certain things within images. So there's like one about galaxies. There's a lot about like biodiversity and animals um, and plants. And uh, they ask you to look for specific things within images and then they bring all that data together um, and have made really amazing discoveries that way. Um, and then there's other that are, others that are more like problem solving games um, that they basically constructed game-like uh, things. Like one is, is looking at protein folding. They ask you to go on and, and try to um, go through a game that allows you to, to do some protein folding, which then contributes to a broader understanding of how, of how the proteins are actually folded. <laughs> That's not a great explanation, but um, you can find out more. Uh, so yeah, there's just a huge variety of ways, and a lot of them are very creative um, in how people can be involved with other aspects of the research process. But I'll also mention that um, in the talk, I talked a lot about like community science and those projects that are really entirely driven by community members. And for those projects, of course, people are involved in every single aspect of the scientific process because they're doing the whole thing. So they need to not only collect the data but also interpret it um, and do the important like communication work that goes along with um, really any science project. And that's all accomplished by communities. So good question. Thank you. So the next one is from um, Samir Hanwad, uh, who's a faculty member here at UB. Um, and the question is, complex problem solving requires building alliances with various social movements within a community. How does the current citizen science framework allow for alliance building across different social movements? Hmm. I'm not sure there is one answer to this question. Um, I think, you know, I don't think that there's a, a current one way of looking at a, a citizen science framework. Um, so I think I'm not sure I can can answer for, you know, the citizen science framework as a whole. I think that um, it's something that each sort of different citizen science initiative or, or a specific group with a, with a goal or aim might have to um, look at more specifically within the context of, of what they're doing. So this isn't a very satisfying answer, but I think that sort of like, like any scientist with a goal uh, working across various social movements within a community, a citizen science project would have to do the same thing, um, but I'm sure it doesn't play out in one way, but instead would be a variety of different ways. I'll leave it at that. All right, so thank you. Our next question is from uh, Dr. Samina Raja, uh, who co-directs CGHG. And her question is, what advice do you have for early career scientists, um, including faculty, who might be interested in embarking on citizen science uh, projects? And wh what do you wish you knew when you got uh, started this work um, that you know today, given your wealth of experience? That's a great question. That's fun to answer. Um, I think mostly what I would say is just pointing people to communities of others who are able to help um, with any specific piece that you might be um, not sure about or needing some guidance on. So I'd point everyone to 
the Citizen Science Association, which is a sort of professional organization for people interested in citizen science. A lot of times it's academics, might also be um, those from NGOs or um, different types of, really a whole variety of different types of organizations that have come together to think about like all the different ways that citizen science can be a, be accomplished or um, can form. And there's a, there's a pretty active listserv. There's um, actually this coming May, there will be a virtual sort of conference where they'll have a variety of different workshops and um, poster presentations and a whole bunch of stuff um, related to any, uh, any aspect of this that you might be interested in learning more about. So there's that and then there's other groups out there that um, I find that it's a really willing community to respond to people's requests for help. So please reach out to others in whatever form, whether it's the Citizen Science Association or, or other groups. Um, people are, like you say, people have been through this before. Oftentimes it is sort of a lonely, getting started in something like this is, can be lonely because um, you don't really know what you're doing and you don't know how to connect to others involved. So people are very happy to answer questions. And thanks for putting that link in the chat. Yeah, I encourage everyone to check out, especially the conference in May, which is called, I'll put it in the chat. I'm sure you can find it just with a Google search. Um, so for those who will be watching this and won't be seeing the chat, it's sit, sigh, virtual. Um, I actually have a question that I think builds on something that was asked earlier by um, uh, by one of the um, the guests, uh, and and I wonder if you could talk about examples where uh, there are you know environmental health or um, or you know health of the environment type of issues that have connected people across the globe and resulted in action that's broader than, uh, you know, action that's that's regional or or national. Can, can you talk about um, some of that and how that, you know, how those connections have worked and, and what kinds of actions have resulted? Yeah. Um, I'm having trouble thinking of a specific international example. I'd say, I mean, one thing that's really interesting about a few of them in the talk that are global and extremely well developed, and um, you know they've been going for a long time, so they're just like really good at what they do. <laughs> the iNaturalist app and the Eber. I think both of those are good examples of um, projects that have really extensive data sets now that are global um, and have been used in a, in a variety of ways for many different purposes, um, like in different areas um, and at different levels of government. So there's a number of papers that have described um, some of the sort of spin-off actions that have happened from that large data set. Like it's collected for one reason, but then it's, since it's publicly available, it can be used for really any, any reason um, in addition to that. And it has been used around the world um, for both local and global um, action. It's not health related, so. Um, yeah, I'd say in, in terms of international, I don't have any good examples of, of um, really concrete actions that have taken place. Conversations happening globally um, related to environmental health. And I guess I'd just point to those. There's a, a, a organization called the Citizen Science Global Partnership that's trying to bring together some of the citizen science conversations happening globally and connect them to um, like priorities from the UN and, and UNEP um, to to move forward more globally, I think. Um, but I think those are still 
more in the initial stages. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if, if uh, our audience has any other questions. So one of the questions that I had as you were speaking um, was related to the technology and, and you were saying that particularly, particularly for air pollution, there are really changing, um, lots of changes in, in, in the technology that, uh, that you can use to, to measure uh, or, you know, air pollution inequality. And I'm wondering uh, how those different, how those changes are viewed, um, especially when you're talking about uh, decision making, or, you know, you mentioned different types of uh, uh, ways in which these data could be used. So um, for regulatory standards, uh, and decisions and enforcement, and I'm, I'm wondering, it, you know, how those changes in in sensors that are sometimes uh, low cost and, and are not, um, you know, they don't necessarily have the same uh, level of, of accuracy that um, that a, an EPA certified uh, monitor might have. I'm, I'm wondering how, how that's viewed and how different groups that use those types of sen sensors, how they use the information that, um, that they're gathering. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's a really tough one that sort of everybody's grappling with at once. Um, so yeah, and in general, it's just, it it's hard for anyone to kind of get your head around how um, changing technology has um, influenced you know, for example, the, the data quality that, that comes off of something like a, a low cost air sensor. I think the um, it's definitely improving. There's a lot more conversations happening about sort of um, that have increased the, the legitimacy, I guess, of, of data coming from low cost tools like that. Um, and, and those conversations continue. Um, I think most most often the strategy has been to use low cost tools or, or tools that are not sort of traditionally the tools used for regulatory processes. I think people think about them as more like screening tools. So if you, for example, would conduct a study um, that documents data about a certain environmental parameter using a low cost tool, you might use that to really raise, raise it as an issue and say like, this deserves further study. Um, and, and then that could be followed up on, ideally. <laughs> That's the struggle is like getting it to be followed up on, I think, um, could use more traditional processes and, and technology to sort of come back and see um, if that can be like confirmed or um, just more investigation into into whatever is going on. So the other the other piece of it that I mentioned towards the end of the talk that you know a big gap that we have in environmental protection is really being able to get our heads around the local variability of some air pollutants and stuff, and that's where low cost air sensors in particular can play a huge role in terms of figuring out how things vary over space and time. Um, and so that's a role that even traditional monitors can't play. So it's added information that we never would have otherwise. Um, and so I think people tend to be a little nervous about um, not knowing how to interpret the data that comes from this, but I think it also needs to be considered an opportunity for us to really understand much more than we otherwise would about um, what's going on um, that traditional regulatory processes just is not are not set up to to understand. Thank you. Um, another question from Dr. Raja. Uh, 
my last question uh, for the evening has to do with the issue of trust or lack thereof of citizen projects among citizens, especially from marginalized communities. What are some ways that citizen scientists have successfully built bridges in communities of color or other marginalized communities like the refugee communities? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think it really gets at to this seminar series as a whole as to how, what that relationship is between scientists and communities and um, how a lot of times that relationship is not, um, not ideal maybe. <laughs> um, and in terms of the second part of your question, like what are some ways that citizen scientists have successfully built bridges I think one important feature of especially the community driven work that I mentioned is just that when those when those projects are actually initiated and run by communities themselves. Um, that can go a long way towards that trust issue um, in terms of um, when people actually participate and uh, you know are are defining the research questions themselves. Um, that is one way and then and then ideally can build more um i guess trustworthy relationships with scientists and institutions towards achieving their goals um yeah i think it's a it's an ongoing discussion and i think a lot of work needs to happen in terms of the best way to to proceed and what what the best practices are for um, scientists and communities working together towards Share goals. All right. Thank you so much. So um, I think unless there are other questions, we will um, wrap up for today. Uh, you've given us a lot to um, to think about, and and thank you for uh, for uh, being with us and answering so many questions uh, that we've um, sent your way. Um, the just a reminder: the recording of this uh, this seminar will be archived soon, um, and so um, you you know you will have a chance to to take a look at it again. Um, but in the meantime, um, thank you so much, Allison, for for joining us and and for telling us about um, about citizen science and community uh, science. And, and how that can address big questions in, in um, global health equity. So um, I hope you have a good evening um, and, and thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. This was a great conversation. I'm looking forward to hearing more. Thank you. Um, goodbye, everybody. <laughs>